If it's in the joints, it makes the joints very painful and they, they bend over, hence the name, the bends. If the bubbles go into the lung, they find it very, very difficult to breathe and uh, that's known to divers as the chokes. But worst of all is if the bubbles are in the brain or the spinal cord when they cause not only great pain but also paralysis that may be permanent or in the worst case, death. To keep the bubbles at bay, Sue had to stay under as much air pressure as possible. It would mean hugging the ground every step of the way. Height is extremely important when it comes to flying a diver with the bends to the recompression chamber. It is absolutely standard practice to stay as low as possible, even though that means taking a bit longer and an indirect route to the recompression chamber, and the air crews train to do this. We set off by the fastest possible route, but staying as low as possible. So we have two options, really. One is to fly all the way around Land's End, which is completely impracticable. And the other one is to follow a small river inland on the North Cornwall coast to join up with the River Tamar, which then runs all the way to Port Bovisand in Plymouth Sound. Just a few metres made all the difference. It's about halfway down cross-country um, to Plymouth. Uh, but the helicopter had to go relatively high over a hill. As we climbed that relatively small height, Susan complained of increasing uh, pain in her chest because she was now conscious. And she became confused and restive and began to struggle. When we flew over the hill, she complained about chest pains. She was certainly uh, very uncomfortable. If we climb above sea level, the pressure drops. If the pressure drops, of course, the nitrogen bubbles will enlarge and more will form. And this is exactly what we were keen to avoid because those bubbles forming and enlarging within the brain and the spinal cord were doing the harm. The size of a bubble depends on a balance of forces, an equilibrium between the force of gas particles inside the bubble pushing out and the force of particles on the outside pushing in. As Sue flew up, there were less air particles squeezing her body and every bubble in her blood but the particles inside each bubble pushed out just as strongly as before. So in the battle to fix the size of the bubbles, the particles inside started to win. They swelled the bubbles up until a new equilibrium was reached with larger, more painful, more dangerous bubbles. With the helicopter flying low once again, there was plenty of air above Susan. It weighed down on her body, keeping the pressure on the bubbles in her blood. But between Susan and safety was one last obstacle. The worst obstacles, unfortunately, were left to last. Flight restrictions up ahead, we've got the bridges and the wire. Is he happy to go over them? Between Plymouth and Salt Ash, there are the road and rail bridges. And to climb to go over those, we would probably have had to have gone to 150 or even 200 metres. And we'd already seen that that caused serious problems. Anything in the way that we could go under, we would go under rather than over. There were a lot of large yachts, and we flew down uh, between the masts of these yachts and underneath the bridge. It's not a thing you do at any time except in an emergency. Knowing the geography of that area, I knew that Bobby Sand was literally around the corner from the Tamar Bridge. Sue was about to dive again, but this time without getting wet. Hello, we're just going to give you some oxygen to breathe, OK? My name's Nikki. I'm one of the nurses here. We're going to take to the chamber now. Within a couple of minutes of leaving the helicopter, she was inside that chamber and recompressed to a pressure equivalent to a depth of 18 metres, a little deeper than she'd actually dived. The recompression chamber is a metal box, sealed, so gas can only go in and out through control valves. OK, on bottom, on oxygen, please. OK. This is the life-saving trick the doctors needed to pull, to squeeze the bubbles in Sue's blood hard enough to make them vanish.
Susan's like this fizzy bottle of water. When I release the pressure, you can see the bubbles rise to the surface. OK, George. Recompression chambers don't just save people's lives. They're also used to train divers because they make the effects of pressure obvious. This is how the chamber works. The walls of the chamber are constantly bombarded by gas particles. When the chamber door is open, the number of particles hitting the inside every second balances the number hitting the outside. The pressure is in equilibrium, even if the door is then closed. To increase the pressure inside the chamber, more gas is pumped in. This means there are more gas particles bouncing off the walls and any body inside. So on average, they get hit more often. That's what makes the pressure. The chamber is strong like a diver's air cylinder, so it doesn't expand. The extra particles inside just push the pressure up. Besides giving you a squeaky voice, a recompression chamber increases the pressure on the patient. This mimics the effect of being underwater without getting wet and it reduces the bubble size. As we can see from our bottle of water when we open it now, there's no bubbles. The gas is still in the water, but now it's dissolved because of the high pressure. As we decrease the pressure in the chamber, the bubbles are slowly released and this simulates a safe, slow ascent in diving. Okay, nine metres, Susan, pump oxygen, five minutes, everybody. Okay. The recompression chamber saved Susan's life. After an hour, she was given a pizza. It didn't taste very nice, apparently, because the pressure makes everything go uh, flat. After two and a half hours, it was perfectly safe to gradually reduce the pressure, open the chamber, and return her to the atmosphere. Bye-bye, Ben. Be a good boy now. We won't be long. Bye-bye. Because John and I had been together for so long, we had this, this sort of kinship. The result of the day was because John was there to help me, and it, it, it's probably brought us closer together as a couple. The experience brought home the, the causes and effects of pressure, and how important our training is, because it was that training that helped save my life on the day. Susan was lucky to live. Now she can tell the tale of just what went wrong underwater. The chest pains were very, very intense, and I wondered at first if maybe I was having a heart attack. But in fact, her air cylinders had been contaminated with carbon monoxide gas. It's effectively like breathing exhaust gases from a car with the same sort of effects. I was keen to get back into the water as soon as possible and I was extremely nervous. I felt very sick. I was quite tearful as well. Um, but I, I was determined that I wasn't going to be beat by this experience. I was very, very lucky. It wasn't my turn to go that day and I've got John to thank and also the crew of the helicopter and Dr Pote and my lucky stars. <laughs>